Welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 140. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the fastest thinker in the West, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mike. This is Mark, the fastest thinker in the Southern Hemisphere, reporting to you live on the Moonshots Podcast. How are you well, this fine winter morning? I'm fine I'm, and I'm enjoying and bathing in, in sunshine, I have to admit. And uh, Mark, I just don't know. Should I be thinking fast or slow on this show? Well, I'm sure you, myself, and some of our listeners are probably asking that very question every single day. In this fast-paced world, how do we distinguish when we want to take a breath and really think about a problem or whether the idea is just to react as quickly as possible? Well, tonight and today, Mike, I think we're going to put that question to rest because we are launching into an absolute classic as a bookend to our mental model series. We're going to be digging into Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. Mm. Now, this is, I mean, I know Einstein, uh, that was heavyweight. This this piece of work uh, by Daniel is also... It's pretty lofty, powerful stuff. I, I think um, much like this entire series, it's like Munger, Einstein, and now Kahneman. I mean, these are some heavyweights, some living legend work to wrap up the series, right? Well, if there were any single books that I remember being recommended when I was first starting out my career, this is one of them. This is probably in the top three I, I'm not sure what the mm. right word would be, gifted maybe, yeah. or recommended books on thinking that I've ever run into and that I've and ever what, seen. And why is that, do you think? I think because it speaks beyond um, boundaries. You know, he, he touches on a lot of core, essential, almost caveman-esque thinking, and he helps us understand how and when we can apply it in our day-to-day lives right now. And I think mm. that concept of contemporary advice is what you and I have run into throughout the entire mental model series so far. These legends like Einstein, who in my mind is untouchable, he's almost like a god of science, Mm. but hearing how he would break down these um, incomprehensive problems like the universe, that's a pretty small problem, right? To try and crack. (laughs) (laughs) Just a little one. Just a small one. And thinking, okay, I'm going to apply this mental model and see how I can think about it differently. That then shows me, well, if he can do it on the universe or gravity or whatever, then I can do it in my own problems here in in this modern world as well. And I think that's why you see a book like Thinking Fast and Slow so popular as well, because it's contemporary. Yeah, it is. It is a great piece of work. And for you, all of our listeners, you're going to be introduced to the two models by which Daniel Kahneman has suggested we can see and think about the world. And this matters because you know what? We often make sloppy decisions. We often are victims of wishful thinking or heaven forbid, our very own bias stops us from making good decisions. It leads us into a world of problems because we just didn't think about thinking. So what we're going to do today is to unveil to you the real essence of the book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And like, this is worth your time. Lend your ears to a Nobel Nobel Prize winning economist who has spent so much of his life breaking down how we think. And this will be the tool set for you to go out into the world to think better, to make better decisions, for you to be the best version of yourself. Mark, I'm ready. I think it is time for us to dive into this world of thinking fast and slow, thinking better, perhaps. Where would you like to begin? I mean, with that proposition in mind, how to change your decision-making from sloppy decisions, sloppy choices, and instead making better decisions, where better than to start with Daniel Kahneman himself telling you and I, Mike, and our listeners how to make better decisions. So, so let's get into our discussion. We have an audience full of investors and entrepreneurs. And they all need to make decisions with less than perfect information. Given all the systematic cognitive biases you've documented, 
how can they make decisions when they are necessarily not fully informed and have to use some intuition? Well, I mean, all decisions are made with only partial information, and, and decisions don't have to be, to be perfect in order to work. I mean, most decisions are imperfect and they still work. So what we can do is improve things at the margin. And improving things at the margin can be done in multiple ways, and this is what we're studying now. So let's, let's hear, how, how are some of the ways to improve decisions well, at the margin? You know, there is a question about intuition. Uh, you know, whether you're for intuition or against intuition, it's absolutely clear that intuition can be marvelous, and it's also absolutely clear that intuition is often wrong. And, and there are a few things that we know. We know about the conditions under which intuition is likely to be right. And I think we know something about how to improve it. And we know that it's likely to be right if you've had a lot of experience, and if the word is sufficiently regular for the, that experience to be worth something. So, for example, I do not believe intuition in intuition in the stock market because the stock market doesn't have the regularity that it takes. But where intuition is worthwhile, is worth having, and it's worth having in many situations, what you really want to do, I think, is to delay it. It's to delay it until you have all the information. The problem with wrong intuitions is they tend to arise very quickly, they tend to be premature. And you're better off if you collect information first and collect all the information in a systematic way and only then allow yourself to take a global view and to have an intuition about the global view. Mm -hmm. This applies in many domains. So take as, delay as much as you can before making that, yeah. that judgment. Yeah, delaying your judgment, gathering the facts. I mean, this, this is insanely simple, but... Oh my gosh, Mark, how could, we're so quick to judgment. We rush to judgment. We rush uh, in the public sphere. We sometimes rush to outrage and all of this. You know, how do you, Mark, slow yourself down? I mean, Daniel's advising us, slow the hell down. Don't rush to judgment. Don't let your intuition run on fight or flight. Take stock of the facts first. I mean, that's easily said. It, it's easily said and much harder done, isn't it? Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's been plenty of times in my career, even now, when I'll be on the receiving end of something. It might be an email or call, um, you know, a bit of feedback or a, a comment from a, a partner, a client, whatever it might be, both in work as well as outside, right? And you in the, immediately your body reacts. Sometimes your body reacts quicker than even your mind. And what I mean by that, Mike, is you, you might feel, your, you know, your inverted commas, your blood boil. <laughs> mm. And I think what Kahneman's calling us out there is instead of, and he's obviously referring to a kind of economic situation, investors, finance, and so on. But let's think about it in a broader sense. Let's think about life as our uh, economic situation. I think what he's calling out here is just take a breath. You know, you and I have spoken about breaths in the past on the show, Mike. The idea of before hitting send on an email, when your gut is kind of saying, well, am I totally sure about this idea? Am I totally sure about the way I'm coming across in this language of the email or a message or a call? Just taking a moment to consider all the facts, including what the other person might be thinking and how the other person might receive the message. I think this is what Kahneman's saying, is it? Just have a pause, don't react, don't let your, uh, your passion or your anger overweigh your mindset of making that better decision. This reminds me of something we've talked about on the show before where um, um, Napoleon would delay all of his mail and he, 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 the reason he did it is people would write to him like, oh, this is big problem. Do you remember this? Yeah. Oh, there's this big problem. But he said to, his, uh, to all of his assistants and uh, support team, Napoleon said, delay all the email. Uh, well, not email. The email. <laughs> Gosh, talk about that. D 
de- de- mail or delay all my <laughs> letters coming in. And in particular, anyone who's asking for something, I want you to delay it all. And um, what he would do is he, he would have a ruler, he'd open it two weeks later. And what he found is often the thing just got resolved before he even opened the letter. And that was the way he reduced his workload. And I think there's something in this, which is we are, we're revved up during the day. We've got messages, calls, meetings, work to do, ping, 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 notification. So we rev up. So we kind of get into a trap where we're trying to operate as fast as our technology around us. And, um, you know, Sometimes I, that doesn't have much of a consequence. It's like, do I have lunch now or in 30 minutes? Do I send this now or in 30 minutes? However, it's when we're making bigger calls, like let's say there's a piece of work and you need to review it before it goes to the next stage. And if you just rush through that and rush consecutively, you might end up with a, a piece of writing, a presentation, an analysis, a spreadsheet that's actually built on a number of Uh, rash judgments. So the end product's just not very good. I think that the fight we're up against is the desire to be quick and efficient, but thinking properly takes time. And I think, you know, is having an awareness, I think, of when the stakes are high and taking time to work on it. This is, for example, why I would always, always um, do work in advance of a deadline or giving a big talk or producing a piece of work because I need to allow myself time to digest the work, the thinking, the ideas. We've often talked about trying to write a week before a presentation, you want to have your table of contents. So you roughly know what you're going to write to or present, build. I think this is like me trying to put in in place this idea of delaying my intuition because what I often find is whether in creative pursuits, uh, professional uh, pursuits, the more time you live with the work and take your time to think it through, the better it gets. You know, Mark, have you ever had that, that experience where you've written something and you've saved the document and it feels really good, right? You think I could probably send this. But you come to it the next day, fresh eyes, and then you might find just one or two little grammar errors, or maybe you're like, you know what, that doesn't quite sound right. I could rewrite that a bit. Do you ever have those moments? All the time, all the time. And and it's one of the, in a, in a funny sort of way, it gives me a lot of satisfaction to come back the next day and to fix it up. You know, to have, a, like you say, a, a table of content, or maybe it's a fleshed out kind of skeleton or point of view written down to be able to have the, um, the time to come back to it the next day is a huge relief. Mm -hmm. So just planning in advance, the ability to work on it, to sleep on it, to wake up the next day and look at it again, maybe get some feedback from a colleague that is, is actually a surprisingly joyous process because you're removing the uncertainty that comes with reacting really, really fast. That's right. That it takes a bit of the anxiety out of it. So, you know, it really sets us up though, because we've got to understand how we think and then we need to allocate time into our diaries to give us ourselves the time and space to do it. You know, there's no use understanding how you think and looking at your, getting to your computer in the middle of the day and say, I have to send this document out at the end of the day. And I'm, I'm having my first, I'm doing my first draft today. Like to me, that is like, I have to protect myself from that. So I would always be looking at the day prior to at least have some sort of pretty good outline. If I'm shipping, like if I'm shipping it on a Tuesday, I need to have a solid outline on the Monday. Otherwise I just don't have time to let it percolate. I don't have time to let it digest to, to really polish it from an 80 up to a 90 or beyond, you know? Yeah. And, and actually I'll, I'll build on that for any of our listeners who are doing exams, um, or, or studying and so on. Something that I'm sure you heard as well, Mike, um, back in the day. And in fact, I think it's still true with the emails and, and problems that we might run into nowadays as well in our careers is read something first and then come back to it. You know, mark an email as a draft or 
read a problem. If you're doing an exam, read the question and then read the next question mm. and the next question, rather than jumping into the result or the answer. Mm. Mm. Instead, read it and allow your subconscious mind to kind of reflect on it as well. Mm. Yeah, so there you've got it. I mean, it's it's really about um, time and space for thinking, which, you know, that's kind of quite contrary to the way in which uh, we work is developing into this hyper fast connected Slack chat um, environment. Um, you know, and I think this is why our listeners love uh, Deep Work by Cal Newport because it's it's about pushing up against that. And um, he, he told us to go deep. And you know what the great thing is where we have equally powerful advice today from Daniel Kahneman in Thinking Fast and Slow. In fact, he has decoded this thinking. So now we're creating space. The question becomes how do we think? And the great news is Daniel Kahneman has the answer. Your book makes use of a very useful analogy. In fact, the analogy is built into the title, Thinking Fast and Slow. System one is thinking fast. System two is thinking slow. What's the difference between the two systems and why is it important for business decision makers to understand the difference? Well, system one is essentially what comes up automatically in your memory. So, you know, when I say two plus two, uh, something comes into your head. When I say your mother, an emotion comes. Uh, so all these things that are automatic, that's what I call system one. And you have no control of it because it's automatic and involuntary. System two, the slower thinking, is distinguished really not so much by the, by the fact that it's slow, although it's pretty slow, but by the fact that it's effortful and deliberate. So what you can do deliberately, you do in system two. And you can do, you can, well, control yourself, control your thoughts. Uh, perform complicated computations, those things are activities of system two. So system one does most of the mental work, it happens automatically, we don't have to worry to where to put our next foot or uh, what word should come next. Some of the work, and it's important work, is done by system two when we slow down. Automatic versus controlled. I think this is a really nice breakdown, Mike, to help me understand Kahneman's two systems, this idea of an automatic quick response versus one that I actually take control over. Yeah, and, and uh, I think the, um, the problem that we've been pointing out is we often deploy fast thinking when we should be deploying slow thinking. What do you think? Is that is that the real problem we're up against? I think the real problem is the, this idea of memory, this idea of muscle memory uh, coming into the way that you react to things. Mm -hmm. So you are a product of your environment or your upbringing, uh, and you might be well-trained. And let me come back to this idea of well-trained in a second. You might be well-trained or experienced through your career to know how to react to an uncomfortable situation. Let's say it's a problem with a colleague, or let's say it's a, a demanding deadline. You might have a natural reaction. Well, I'm going to blame somebody, or I'm going to go and tell them that it can't be done. That reaction, like I say, it's not well uh, exercised. It could be a bad habit. And I think what Kahneman's saying to us here is this idea of a memory reaction You've got to know and be aware whether that reaction is actually a good one or not. You might have cultivated a reaction as part of your experience that is actually quite damaging. And by reacting in that same way again and again, it's not a good habit because it's, it's a poor mental model that you're following. Mm, mm. And I think, um, you know, a great example of this is the saying, you know, count to 10. You know how people say, look, exactly. just count to 10, take a breath. Because what's happening is your automated response wants to just fly, right? Particularly if it's sparking fight or flight <laughs> a response, right? And, and, exactly. uh, and, you know, it's this idea about shifting in, into slow. So it's really interesting, two different systems, sort of a, you know, a very deliberate uh, way of thinking, the, the slower way of thinking versus the automated 
thinking. So I'm curious, Mark, when when you're presented with that this idea of of this, do you have like a playbook on on when to and how to like how what's what are the rules to this game? Well, I think the what comes to my mind as we're continuing this journey into the mental model series where we learn from Einstein, Shane Parrish, and Munger, was uh, this concept of second-order thoughts, mm-hmm. second-order thinking, where don't just rely on your immediate uh, first reaction. So challenge yourself and think, okay, well, we're about to um, make a decision on who to cover in our next podcast, Mike. Yeah. And we might think, okay, well, you know, Mike really likes... Uh, this author, Mark really likes that author. Let's meet in the middle and choose uh, author Z instead. When actually the truth is we want to create shows and episodes that our listeners want to hear. So by applying a bit of second order thinking, we might turn around in our record and say, hey, listeners, please get in touch and let us know who you want us to cover. Mm. And I think that's this, that the fast thinking would be you and I making a decision without considering that end user having a moment to think more controlled, maybe a bit slower, we might reach out to our listeners who are making the show for and ask for their point of view. Does that, mm. does that make a little bit of sense? It, it does. And, and I think what's really fascinating is how big this universe is of mental models and how to apply them, how to think. I mean, that's why we've done this entire series is so we can make better decisions. We can apply the right model for the right context. Mark, we've got the first one. Why don't you kind of set it up so we can go and break down system one? Yeah, this is a great breakdown from Productivity Game telling us about um, Kahneman's first system. So let's hear from Productivity Game telling us about what you see is all there is. What's your automatic response to the following riddle from Thinking Fast and Slow? Steve is a very shy and withdrawn American who's invariably helpful but has little interest in people or the world of reality. Steve is a meek and tidy soul, and he has a need for order and structure. Is Steve more likely to be a librarian or a farmer? If librarians seem like the obvious choice, based on the limited information I gave you, then you've just been fooled by System 1 again. If you slow down and use System 2, you might realize that the probability of Steve being a librarian is very low. If you verified your fast, intuitive conclusion, you'd realize that there are substantially more farmers than librarians in the United States. In fact, there are roughly 20 times more male farmers than male librarians. Jumping to a conclusion about Steve is a hallmark feature of System 1. System 1 loves to use limited information to form quick judgments and then block out all conflicting information. I call this the tunnel vision bias. Author Daniel Kahneman calls it W-Y-S-I-A-T-I. What you see is all there is. Kahneman explains that System 1 sees two or three pieces of information and then infers and invents causes and intentions and then neglects ambiguity and suppresses doubt. This is why you can meet someone and assume you know what they're like based on their profession or what they look like, only to realize much later with much more information that your judgment was completely wrong. To counteract our natural tendency to form beliefs based on limited information, we need to get in the habit of asking ourselves, why might the opposite be true? When I'm given a project that's similar to a project I've done before and believe it'll be easy, I ask myself, why might the opposite be true? This question gets me to test old assumptions, be prepared for new challenges ahead, and prevent me from underestimating a project and misleading other people. Regardless of the situation, asking why might the opposite be true widens our lens and helps us identify helpful information we've been subconsciously ignoring Uh, This is so good because, Mark, I was seeing a middle-aged, balding man with glasses and a cardigan. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to admit it. I was really trying to visualize it for the exercise, and I was like, oh, my gosh, I did not have a farmer in mind. How about you? (laughs) Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's true. And, And, again, it's just a wonderful thought experiment there because, I think you, myself, and maybe even our listeners will probably automatically go for that, for that reaction, you know, and that is just us inferring it in our own minds. It is, isn't it? And, you know, you know, the thing is, when we look at the pattern here, there was an instant mental model we got 
which is to o- intentionally take the opposite side of the argument, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever uh, assumption you're drawing, whatever image you're drawing of potentially a solution to a problem, just ask yourself, well, how would I do the, the inverse, the opposite? And it's building these disciplines just to not rush to judgment, but to have a few exercises um, you know, I love the idea of just writing down the uh, the first principles, the undeniable truths of a problem. Like, what is the data that we have? Then you can say, hmm, is there any patterns in the data? And then once you have a hypothesis about the solution, then what you can start to do is say, okay, I think it's going left is going to solve this. But for, I mean, it's like debating society back at school. Well, let's just take the opposite point of view and argue that and see how that feels. And that's often something that you'll see in in law practice is in order for your position as a lawyer to be stronger, the way they prepare is to then uh, attack their own position as if they're on the other side to Mm. see if if there's any weakness in, in the argument. And I think if you can build stronger arguments by being agile and nimble to take on different points of view. I mean, to me, this is huge because if I look at how I thought in the early part of my career, it was all jumping to conclusions, wishful thinking. It was all, you know, kind of luck. And once you, once you really think through your an approach to a problem rather than just rushing to solution, to me, this unearths a world of opportunity of mental models and thinking different, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and I think to take it um, a step further, it, there's an assumption that I think some of us have, or an inference, to use um, maybe Kahneman's language, an inference that we all have with regards to success. So we assume that Einstein or Munger were just gifted by the gods, <laughs> you know, they had an unworldly talent and that was it. They just had a, a brain that just worked and there's no hope for us mere mortals because they're the ones who are out there, um, choosing the right stock or solving, um, scientific problems and so on. And our inference is, okay, well, that's, that's just the way that they deal with things. But actually, as we've been finding out, they are just the ones using these mental models, Mike. They are the ones challenging their assumptions or their their own blockages in their own brains. They're the ones who are making those better decisions by just breaking it down a little bit easier so that they can react and think better. And I think that's really the, the biggest aha throughout this series for me, which is how to take the... Um, the concepts that these individuals are saying, such as inversion, you know, maybe starting at the end, or let's try and argue the opposite as the lawyers might do Mm -hmm. by putting yourself into that almost um, competitor thinking or Mm -hmm. different way of thinking. That's how you're going to go out and solve that, that problem or consider something in a totally different way. Yeah. So I I think um, this jumping to conclusions is perhaps the simplest way of saying what is our enemy, right? Just jumping Mm -hmm. to conclusions um, and not having uh, more information. You'll never have all of the information as Kahneman says, but search to take time to examine the facts. Um, I mean, geez, in some ways it sounds insanely simple and straightforward, But if you just need to look around uh, in the world and we see that people are constantly falling victim to rushed decisions, Mm. Uh, like you you just think about um, if you only were to take the sports world and look at all of the, you know, uh, mid-season transfers and end-of-season transfers where people um, buy players thinking they're going to be great and turn out to be like zip or uh, a decision to swap a player at a certain time. These are all, I mean, we see it's a spectacle of decision-making in front of us and it's just the same in life, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. And I think this is one of the um, ideas that Kahneman makes us aware of in thinking fast and slow, which is this, this system one, this thinking fast is something that just runs continually, Mm. runs continually, when you wake up, I think both of them run and both systems one and systems two are 
alive and conscious in your brain when you're awake, of course. Mm. But system one is kind of like a heartbeat and it's continual. And what we need to learn is to not allow system two, the conscious or the slower thinking, to be completely disregarded so that we're only, inverted commas, shooting from the hip. Mm. You can have system one thinking. It's always going to be active and it's always going to be around. But when you have a, a problem or something that requires a little bit of real conscious consideration, that's when we should challenge ourselves and call in the idea of taking more time in our day, maybe doing the deep work, as Cal Newport would say, maybe turning off our notifications, as we've discussed before, and just doing that deep work, being able to put on your system two hat <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and going against that system one automatic response. Yeah. This is such a, a um, an awakening. I think it's such a, an opportunity to embrace this because I, I, I feel um, so grateful to be doing this series together for all of our listeners because you know, I'm in, I'm in my early days of discovering mental models and I'm a huge fan of, of Shane Parrish and the work that he's doing. And I just feel so lucky to realize, to have the aha moment, there are different ways to think. And it kind of becomes really fun. If you look at Charlie Munger, he's like, well, I try to have like a hundred models in my mind. So when a thing comes past me, I'm like, can I imply one of my models to that? If so, if it's in my, um, if it's in my circle of competence, then, you know, maybe Warren and him will make an investment. And I think it's so fun to think that th it's about having this tool set so that when the right things come, you're like on it, you apply the model and you get a better result. I mean, that's, that is pretty exciting stuff. I mean, it's, it's kind of liberating, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. Li liberating is, is actually quite a good word for that. It's the relief that I was talking about earlier. When you've got the mm. time to reflect on your own work, then you kind of have that, that sense of, ah, yes, I know I've done my best job here because I made mm. the time to come back to it, to reflect on it, to think about it, uh, stew on it overnight or whatever it is. Uh, but you can only practice that when you're aware of that value. And I mm. think why Kahneman's quite a, a nice bookend to our, our current series, Mike, is because he's showing us, okay, well, if you've learned all these mental models and you're like Munger, you've got a hundred in your repertoire and you can call on them when needed. Here's Kahneman now telling us, okay, well now let's figure out how we apply it. Let's figure out how our conscious and unconscious mind works mm. so that instead of reacting in the standard way, um, stock automatic system of mm. system one, instead use some of those mental models with your system two thinking in order to go and make that better decision. Yeah. And Mark, I've got great news for you. It's not only us here on the show that is doing this deliberate and constructive thinking and giving great advice. In fact, some of our members are, are really getting in the spirit of things. I think we have to celebrate some of the great feedback that we've been getting. I think it's time to, to cast our eyes across the, uh, across the Pacific to one of our neighbors. Don't you think? Mark? Yeah. We want to give a, a heartfelt, um, very enthusiastic, very celebratory and very, um, specific call out to Jess from New Zealand, who has given us not only Mike, some, some powerful thoughts to consider, but also some great, uh, uh, feedback that's kind of put a smile on our face. You know, when our listeners get in touch and it shows that they've had a listen to our shows and they've got recommendations on how you and I, Mike, and our team can make our shows better. I mean, that's, that to me is a pretty unique position. It's, it's quite nice to hear from somebody who's consuming us through the headphones in the day-to-day -day world, and they've taken time out of their day to give us um, some helpful suggestions. I mean, that's what we're doing here, Mike. We're learning out loud, and to learn from our listeners as well is, is pretty special. Yeah. So a big thank you to Jess. And, and she is an official Moonshotter, Mark. She is a member of the Moonshots podcast. And we are so excited to welcome her and the other folks that are all joining in. And we want to make an invitation to you, our listeners. We want you to become a member of the show because becoming a member of this show gives you access 
to our master series. We've finished the first one, which is live, which is a deep dive, a 90 minute deep dive with worksheets and tools on motivation. And the next one inspired by this series is going to be on first principles and how you can think better. And if you become a member, your contribution, your donation will help us build our very famous and much desired mobile app. So come on, Moonshotters. We know you can do it. Get in there, become a member. It's like a dollar a week and you get access to our Moonshot Master Series. You get uh, to contribute uh, just like Jess has. But here's the other thing. You'll give us the resources to make the experience even better. It's going to help us build our mobile app. So come on, get in there. We really appreciate you guys joining with us to learn out loud and you can be part of it even more by becoming a member. And Mark, if I want to become a member, where do I go? For those who want to join the Moonshots family, pop along to www.moonshots.io and hit the members section. And via Patreon, you can subscribe up and become part of our friends and family circle. I mean, it's great, Mike, that we're seeing the group grow week by week. It's so exciting. It is. And and pretty soon we'll be releasing our second master series, which is going to really, I think, blow the top off first principles. So if you're getting into this thinking series, we know that uh, in particular, the Einstein series was hugely popular. We thank you for sharing the experience with us. Head over to moonshots.io if you want to get more into first principles and thinking better, become a member and listen to our master series. Okay, Mark. So we've kind of set the scene uh, in the work from Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and slow. We know we're in a big hurry and we can make some pretty ugly decisions. He's saying, slow down, pause the intuition for a little bit, you know, gather the facts and be aware that there are these two systems. System one, you know, this fast, impulsive, automated approach. But now it's time, Mark, for us to actually dive into the second system, system number two. And this is where we really start to get a little zen and where Daniel Kahneman is going to tell us about slowing down. System one, the intuitive, fast thinking system in which most people spend most of their time, operates in a state that you call cognitive ease. Well, system two requires something you call cognitive strain. Um, When you're taking the easy path of system one, what kinds of mistakes are you prone to? In the first place, you are going to act more impulsively. You know, you're going to act quickly. So if your impulses turn out to be wrong, you know, if you're not a chess player, but you're sort of living in a world where f- first impulses are not necessarily wrong, you may m- make mistakes which, by the way, not all mistakes are avoidable, but there are some mistakes that if you brought system two to bear, if you slowed yourself down, you could avoid. So when you are in a in the sort of free flow mode of uh, cognitive ease and system one running the show, you're going to be more impulsive, you're going to be more emotional, you're going to be more optimistic, uh, and you're going generally to follow your first uh, impressions and your first intuitions. And isn't that good? Haven't we read that your gut is right 90% of the time? No, it's not right 90% of the time. The chess player's gut, if the chess player is a master, is right 90% of the time. Those are situations that allow for skill. But when we're dealing with situations, whether to invest in this or that, or whether to, uh, we're not always. Uh, They're the first impulse is not necessarily right the first time. That's such a good wake up, Mike. Because I think there's a natural tendency in life, I suppose, probably across a number of different business verticals and um, careers that we can all choose, where you trust your gut. You trust your instinct about maybe a business decision or how to speak to um, a colleague. You just, uh, there's something invisible and you just think, yeah, my gut has served me well all these years. I'll trust it again. I think this is the big wake up call that Kahneman is challenging us with by saying, nope, that's an impulse. Nope. You're probably reacting potentially from a bad habit perspective. 
and by not providing yourself an opportunity to do the uh, the system two thinking or the slow thinking or the cognitive strain thinking, you're not giving yourself enough of a chance to do better thinking. And unless you have, as you say, that Zen moment, you're going to react in a way that 90% of the time is probably incorrect. It's, it's really... It's really a call uh, to action. Um, don't rush to judgment. So, Mark, the question becomes, knowing that the chances are we're doing too much fast thinking and not enough slow thinking, what could you do in your week this week to slow down your decision making it and to take your time to make better decisions? I mean, you know, with an agenda as busy as mine, Mike, I don't have time to slow down. I have, to, <laughs> I have to, I have to make things up as I go. No, you're, um, you're like in a whack-a-mole game. Yeah, exactly. Making. But how how true is that idea? You know, the idea that life is just a whack-a-mole that we're all trying to, you know, get on top of, hmm. and and it's not um, conducive to doing good work as we've already as we've already found out. Hmm. For me, it's really about preparation. It's about, um, scheduling. So Uh scheduling in enough moments to have, um, constructive focused conversations with, with colleagues or partners. Uh, and by partners, I mean, you know, business, um, uh, clients, um, customers that you're working with, Uh maybe even consumers factioning in enough time to, to speak to them and doing an almost scientific approach to these, these problems, I think is where you are going to um, benefit a busy, busy schedule because instead of, as we found out with system one thinking, reacting straight away, you're probably going to make those little mistakes that none of us really want to admit. And when you know we reach the end of our week, Mike, we want to look back and know that we've done a great deal of, of positive and good work. So only by scheduling in advance and giving yourself enough time do I find that I um, can think better in a, in a mm. cognitive way? Mm. How about yourself? So let's, let's do some brainstorming because, I mean, effectively this entire show and this entire book is getting us to like, hey, habitually we generally just are impulsive and automated in our thinking. And a typical moonshot way of doing this, Mark, is we're like, okay, how do we do it? How do we do it? So. I think there's like some golden rules. Much of what you've talked about is just planning your time. Okay. But let's, let's go um, even further. I think when you're thinking about a problem and you're considering some solutions, I think limit the options is great advice. All right. If you, uh, we, Mark, just recently, I think it was yesterday, we were talking about the paralysis we get on Netflix because there's too many <laughs> options, right? It's so true. All right, that's going to just, kill your thinking. So if you're, if you're really going through an exercise of coming up with a solution, then maybe choose between one, two, maximum three. I think allocating the time to do this and like, let's say you've got a big call that you need to make on Monday, then I wouldn't just be saying, talk about it on Friday. I think you want to do a series of activities on Wednesday and Thursday, then let the weekend happen. Come back to it on the Monday and you're like, yep, I'm totally into the problem space. I've thought about it. My recommendation would be option two. So, so I think that 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 prioritization, uh, that scheduling works. But I think not all um, decisions are as big as each other. So I think obviously you need to look at some of your key decisions and prioritize ones that have got the most impact. Right? If if there is a really big decision defer addressing other decisions until you've tackled this. Because Mark, you know, the interesting thing about this is that if you know you've got some big decision coming, it's very hard to focus on other stuff anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it's absolutely uh, difficult to tune out other work that's in the back of your mind unless you're really focusing on it right then and there. Yes. Um, And um, I love the idea I've, you know, I've been talking about this example of like a week is um, let's say you've got this decision to make on the Monday. I love kind of doing like 90% of the work 
before Friday, but just leaving this little space to come back at it fresh on, on the Monday after the weekend. Um, and just giving you the chance for one last, how do the facts settle with me? And if, if you're feeling like there's something in the data that's not quite right, then it gives you the capacity to go back at it. I think because of that, that habit of rushing, we're always doing it. Now, the last thing I would say is um, you've got to go to your mental models. You know, we've talked about in this series, there are many different mental models. So what you need to do is to do a quick uh, check, I think, to make this time. I would first say, are you trying to solve an, a problem? Are you trying to make a decision or are you trying to design a system of sorts? So like if you're into this problem solving thing, you know how we talked about the Ishikawa diagram, which helps you get to the root of something, um, like a conflict resolution diagram maybe, or maybe even with problem solving, you approach the problem from a different point of view. That was the inversion model we talked about. So I think Step one, Mark, is like we have to have like a bit of a go-to. Um, we need to know our models well enough so that on the fly we can say, okay, is this problem-solving, decision-making, or systems thinking? Which one? And then apply the model. So I just did problem-solving. So, Mark, if, if we're going to make a, a decision, right, what, what do you think are the models that come to your mind that might be really – handy to use for a decision-making approach. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I think the Ishikawa is a, is a bit of a classic, isn't it? That can help me understand where the, uh, a cause of a, an event might identify potential challenges that are coming my way and therefore enable me to potentially solve a problem quicker. Yeah. The, um, uh, for decision-making, I definitely be looking at, um, you know, second order thinking, like, okay, if we decide to go left, then what would happen? Oh, geez, if we do that, then it's got all these consequences. Mm, so that's exactly. a really good model for decision uh, making. Uh, there's the old Edward de Bono, wear six different hats, all right, uh, to come at it. In fact, um, I think if you've got to make a decision, you may even use one of my favorites, the Eisenhower matrix. Well, you know what? I was going to save the Eisenhower matrix um, for when you're trying to determine how to break up your time and prioritize a challenge. But you know, what is it? But Mark, work with me. That's a decision. Exactly. exactly. That's, why, that's why it's a perfect model for decision making, right? Yeah. Now, another, really one, another one to do is this last one. And this one, is quite interesting for us because it's all about product design, which is kind of our universe. And you can do all sorts of things. You can do the um, uh, connection circles model where you start to explore relationships and loops and systems. That one's really good. Another one, which is super fun, is the iceberg model. So we always talk about like there's the peak that's above the waterline and then there's everything below. So you could take an event or, or a product or a thing and say, what's above the waterline? But what are all the things happening below the waterline that we don't see? What are the hidden activities? Um, very good. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking about product stuff, you can think about different um, balance loops. Uh, you can think about reinforcement uh, loops that are in, like how does something um, happen over time? What is the, the looping factor inside of a situation or inside of a product. The point I think we've got here, Mark, is that there you've got to have these systems at hand in order to think better. You've got to start really picking one or two, just start with one even that you really like, like second level thinking. I'm just going to go deeper and think about consequence. These are all really, they're there. They've been studied, they've been nurtured, and they're there at our disposal. It's really a question of are we going to make time to slow ourselves down and ask which of those models are best? I mean, that's pretty awesome, right? I mean, it reminds me of what Charlie Munger said in our last show, Mike, uh, show 139. He was calling on us as, as individuals to not go throughout life just knowing what you know right now because you're going to have a disservice when you run into potential challenges or problems, right? Imagine leaving school and learning nothing else for the rest of your life. I know. And I know. by taking that ownership and knowing, okay, well, 
I'm going to run into some challenges. Maybe it's product design, or maybe it's running a business, or maybe it's managing my money. All of these require different skills and different lessons, don't they? So this idea of constant lifetime learning is really what I think this this mental model series is, has revealed to me at least, and probably to our listeners. And listeners, if you're hearing us referencing all these different mental models and ideas and diagrams, head on over to moonshots.io and check out our mental model series where we've touched upon some of these great mental models, Mike, inversion, second order thinking thought principles. Uh, it's been it's been an education for me at least. It has. It's we're we're learning out loud with you, our listeners, the moonshotters. We're so glad to share this with you because personally this has been um, incredibly powerful in helping me in my journey just to make better decisions, to be a little bit better every day. And I think it is only appropriate that we have one last thought from Daniel Kahneman to bring us home. And it's all about avoiding the noise. So let's elaborate on this. I think some of your, your current work is on different ways of tuning out the noise. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? Well, there is an enormous amount of noise in decision making. I mean, we, we became aware of that, of the extent of that actually in an insurance company in asking by how much do underwriters who look at exactly the same risk differ in their assessments. And we compared that to the expectations of the executives. And the differences among underwriters were about five times as large as expected by the executives. And it turns out that this is true wherever you go. We now have a sort of saying, wherever there is judgment, there is noise. And there is more of it than you think, because people underest overestimate the extent to which others agree with them and underestimate the amount of the extent of differences very consistently and very systematically. Well, that would suggest in entrepreneurial environments taking the time, or in corporate environments taking the time to, to almost write down areas of agreement to avoid this, this cognitive bias. Well, I mean, you know, the, the one danger in all of this is you don't want to paralyze yourself by too much analysis, and you don't want to paralyze yourself by too many bureaucratic procedures. So finding the best way to combine a disciplined approach to decision making with something that is not too bureaucratic and that decision makers will feel is a help to them rather than a sort of a, a bureaucratic constraint, that's a tough exercise. It is a tough exercise. There you go, Mike. Thank goodness we're hearing from Daniel Kahneman himself telling us and reassuring us it can be tough to be disciplined with yourself and to not be bogged down in uh, being, you know, drowned out by the noise of your system one thinking when you're trying to solve a problem. Yeah, I, I cannot think of a better way to describe our modern lives as, you know, surrounded by noise. Like if you think about everything that is fighting for our attention and how beautiful a quiet, still, and peaceful morning feels. Um, I feel like that's a sanctuary amidst all of this information, news, communications, and notifications. And I think if you are aware of the world in which we live, and if you're a geriatric like me and you remember the life <laughs> before internet <laughs> where we used to send faxes to our clients, you know, the, the reality becomes that you've got to realize that we, we have, you know, thinking is a precious resource and all of that noise is stealing our attention, stealing our energy. So we have less, less power and less energy for thinking about the big stuff. So be deliberate, uh, be purposeful and intentful in allocating time to things that matter, decisions that matter, and don't rush them, craft them, hone them. And um, I'm sure the outcomes will be far better. What about you, Matt? Yeah, th this is a, a, such a huge call out that I think has been consistent across all of our individuals in the Mental Model series, starting with Einstein, just making the time to think about the problem. Do you remember that quote from Einstein? I'll spend 95% of my time thinking about the problem, 5% of the time thinking about the solution. I think this is bang on that same concept. Spend time to get rid of all the distractions, mm. spend time to think about that problem rather than rushing, 
in, in a fast thinking approach to jump to a conclusion or a reaction or infer a reaction. Instead, spend enough time just focusing on the problem at hand. Give yourself that breathing space. Be deliberate and controlled about it. And that reaction or that result will be far greater. I think this has been a big lesson for me, Mike, to really challenge myself in how I, in how I think and how I react to problems in, yeah. in my day-to-day world. That's exactly it, Mike. That's exactly it. And out of, you know, we were brainstorming that big list of things that you can do. Um, what can you, what one practice could you do, do you think, to help you allocate a little bit more of your thinking into the slow category rather than the fast? Mm, well, I was really, I learned a lot from Cal Newport's recent book, A World Without Email. And I think that's very much a first step in, as Carnum's calling out in that final clip, avoiding the noise. I think being deliberate about when and how to use distractions and notifications is very much a way of of giving yourself time. And I quite like the distinction you made a minute ago, Mike. Those notifications take energy away from your ability to solve those problems. So I think being really focused and removing technology is going to be the thing for me that I, I think will help me think in a more slow, deliberate way. Where, where, do you, where does your mind go? Uh, I would probably say making more time to explore different models. Mm. So I nice. probably quickly grab a model and, and go for it. I'm okay about the, the time allocation. I think the quality of my thinking could be better if I explored, if I was more deliberate about deliberately thinking in the way I don't think the answer is, but you know, thinking the, taking the opposite side of the argument deliberately or, you know, any of those models that I described, just being more curious to explore different approaches. I'm, I'm often pretty time constrained. So I, so it's, it's a little challenging. So, uh, I've got to find, um, a way to quickly punch through a different couple of models. I think my thinking could be better if I did that. Yeah. Experiment. That's yes. what Munger was saying as well. Yeah, Experiment yeah. with these different models, see what works, or maybe see one work and then try another and think mm. and see if that one works as well. Yeah, that's a nice call out. Very good. A nice call out indeed. And what a great show, um, Mark, delving into this fast and slow thinking. What a great series. How do you feel at the end of the mental model series? I think what I have been impressed by is the concepts of these mental models from these these hugely well-known and recognized and celebrated authors and thinkers is not how necessarily cerebral a lot of these challenges or considerations are, but how practical. We've learned a lot of very um, actionable uh, logistical steps, Mike, that you and our listeners can can put into our, our day-to-day lives straight away. I think that's what's really struck me, how, how practical these concepts from all the way from Einstein now to Kahneman have been. Yeah. And isn't there this meta learning like um, that in the end, the successful thinkers are those that make the time to think and they prioritize their effort and spend a ton of time just getting the facts on the most important things. Like Einstein's like, basically, I just thought about the one thing more than anybody else. It's right? so good. Yeah. And, and that's really powerful. And then on the other hand, you're like, damn, this is a whole, this is down to one thing and it's discipline. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, not that old discipline again. Can't there be a, like a secret sauce, like a yeah. magic powder? Come on. Can't I just take a supplement and that'll make oh, it all easier? <laughs> oh, discipline, hard work. Well, Mark, Mark. Thank you for, for joining me in this mission to decode the work of Daniel Kahneman. And thank you for producing uh, together with me this whole mental model series. It has been wonderful. And thank you to you too, our listeners, our moonshotters, those of you who are joining us to learn out loud so we can be the best version 
of ourselves. And today, show 140, we did that with Daniel Kahneman and his work, Thinking Fast and Slow. Because this is really important. We never have all the information that we need to make a decision, but we've got to have a way to make better decisions. So we need to start, he says, to delay your intuition. But then what? We delay? What happens next? Well, we've got two choices. We should be aware of our automatic thinking and then our slow and deliberate thinking. In fact, what Daniel Kahneman has done is presented us two systems that can help us think better. And here's the thing. In the end, we're always a little too tempted to automate our thinking, to do fast thinking. We need to make more time for slow thinking. And if we're going to make decisions, leave your emotions at home, get rid of the noise, take a breath, don't rush, take your time, get the facts, select your mental model of choice, and you will indeed make better decisions if you can think fast and slow. So there you have it, everybody. That is the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.